Happy Halloween, you ghosts and ghouls, and welcome to this Thursday's event of the FTC rulings about click to cancel. Uh, let me tell you uh, up front that we are recording this. It will be available uh, for replay on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash at checkout hyphen champ. And you'll be able to access this at any time. I want to take the opportunity to interview introduce an old friend of mine and attorney and father and husband and just all around kick-ass guy despite the fact that he um he is maybe has many opposing views to me it causes uh, great conversation while we're having some beers so a little, hey, anyway a little let me introduce yeah. Damon Wright from from Gordon Reese Man Scully and Shulkin, or however it's pronounced, Damon, you could go through this. Yep. All right. Thanks, Matt. Damon is Damon is a partner at we just call it Gordon Reese or GRSM, and he specializes in all things e-commerce. And he's a he's a wonderful attorney, super bright dude. He's always if, for the last few years. If any of you have received our our e-commerce guide, legal guide. Uh, for 2023, 2024, Damon and his team are the ones that write it. So he comes with an abundance of knowledge and he's volunteered today to join us for a conversation regarding the new FTC click to cancel rules that are coming out. I'm sure he's torn through it. I know we're going to have a lot of questions and talking about questions. The Q&A is open. So we're going to start talking about this. I'm going to pass this off to Damon. We're going to talk about ways to protect yourselves and prepare your companies for the rule changes. Feel free to ask uh, any questions that, that you might have in the, the Q&A. And when we have a theatrical pause, I will ask the questions to Damon and we'll get the answers that hopefully everyone's looking for. So Damon, without further ado, please take over. Thanks a lot, Matt. Okay, so it's appropriate that we're doing this on Halloween because the FTC has gotten very scary. Uh, I don't know if we'll see anyone dressed up in a Lena Khan mask uh, in my neighborhood, but um, that, that would be pretty creative. So, and she's the, the chair of the FTC. So we're going to talk about the FTC click to cancel rule that was announced uh, just last week, or I guess two weeks ago, October 16. What I want to do, um, though, is give you all a history lesson, just so you can kind of understand the landscape and the context of what we're dealing with here. So let's start with a federal law that hopefully folks who do subscription billing have long known about. And that's a federal law enacted about 20 years ago called ROSCA. And that stands for the Restore Online Shoppers Confidence Act. And it's a law that the FTC has long enforced dealing with subscription billing. And it has three requirements. And Congress enacted this law. It's not an FTC rule. Congress enacted it. And the three requirements are with subscription billing you first have to have clear and conspicuous disclosure of the subscription billing terms, meaning what is someone going to pay? How often are they going to be charged? How do they cancel? And that needs to happen before the transaction is completed. It has to be disclosed prominently. It can't be in fine print in the footer. It can't be in your website terms that you have to click and open to read. It's got to be at least on the checkout page and above the fold above the buy button, clear and conspicuous disclosure, that's the first requirement. The second requirement is that the consumer has to provide express affirmative consent to those terms. And the most ironclad way to do that is with an unchecked checkbox. And next to that checkbox, you could have that clear and conspicuous disclosure, but it would be something like, I understand I am paying $29.95 today and I'll be charged $29.95 each month for this product unless and until I can cancel my subscription. All right, so that's the second element or requirement. The third is there must be a simple and easy mechanism to cancel the subscription. And for a long time, that was call customer support or send an email. And the idea was if people are doing that, they shouldn't be on hold for a long time. There shouldn't be this really drawn out gauntlet save the sale process. It should be uh, quick and painless for the consumer. And so that's ROSCA, and for years the FTC has enforced it. it. A lot of cases, as people probably all know, a lot of cases against the, the free trial 
skin muscle diet supplement industry, um, but other cases against major brands. And, and then we've had, after Roscoe was enacted, a lot of state subscription building laws, California, New Hampshire, Vermont, Virginia. California is the most demanding and California amended its subscription billing law this summer to say, you have to provide click to cancel. If someone's being able to buy something by clicking a button, they should be able to cancel by clicking a button. And so California was kind of out in front of the FTC on this. Uh, California also requires annual email reminders of the subscription billing terms how to cancel. All right, so we have Rosca. And the FTC has had no problems going after businesses with Rosca. And they can get money under Rosca. And it's the Civil Penalty Authority uh, that goes up every year. Currently, the Civil Penalty Authority is $51,000 or up to $51,000 and change per violation. And the FTC interprets per violation to mean every single customer. And the keywords, though, are, are also up to. The FTC doesn't automatically get that much money. It's up to a court to decide. The court could say $5, $1,000. And most settlements don't involve fifty-two dollars or $51,000 per violation because those numbers would be in the stratosphere. You know, 5,000 customers multiplied by 51,000 is a big number. So that's Roscoe. The question is, why is there this FTC new click to cancel rule? Why do they need it? They've had, they've had Roscoe. They brought cases under Roscoe. They can get a lot of money under Roscoe. The real reason for the new FTC click to cancel rule is that it has nothing really to do with subscription billing. The real reason it was enacted is because the FTC is trying to find ways to get money for deceptive advertising. And that goes back to the Supreme Court case a few years ago, AMG Capital. And that's a case where the Supreme Court decided 9-0 that in the, the false advertising cases the FTC was bringing under Section 5 of the FTC Act, they were not actually allowed to get money. They could only get an injunction, an order to the company saying, stop doing deceptive advertising. And everyone thought the FTC was going to be humbled by that decision because they lost 9-0. And the FTC was going to be more measured. Uh, it actually had the complete opposite effect. The FTC got pissed. It was like, you think you, you think we're down? No, F you, we're coming back stronger, angrier than ever. And so if you read the new FTC click to cancel rule closely, you'll see that it actually says that it prohibits any material misrepresentation made in connection with selling a product or service on subscription. So let's back up. What that means is you can make a material misrepresentation in selling a product on a straight sale. And right now the FTC would have no basis to get money because of AMG Capital. But if you make a material misrepresentation in connection with selling a product on subscription, even if you, you've complied with the subscription billing requirements, the, basically the Roscoe requirements, and you have a click to cancel button, the FTC could still say you violated the law because you said normally this product sells for $595, but today we're, and you slash through that price, but today we're going to sell it for 70% off. If the FTC comes in and says, we want to see that you actually previously sold it for that higher price, and we don't think you did, they could say you violated the click to cancel rule. Or they say there's a testimonial on your website. We don't believe this person actually used your product. We think they're just an actor. Or you said made in USA, but some of your product actually is sourced from other countries. Uh, or it's an earnings claim. And they say that you, you're selling a, um, a co yeah, trading or, trade or education service or a, a business coaching service. And they say you've misrepresented what the average student has made. All, all those kinds of things can now be asserted as a violation of the click to cancel rule, even though they have nothing to do with the subscription billing terms. 
So it's another way the FTC, after a loss of the energy capital decision, they basically hit the books and said, okay, what can we do to find other pathways to get money? And this is what they came up with, one of several ways they've come up with. They're doing other things as well. And we can talk about that, but it, it's, it, most folks wouldn't understand that necessarily, but that's the history. That's what's going on. So hopefully that, 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 that what I explained makes sense. Let me just throw out a quick disclaimer. This, this conversation is not to bash on the FTC. If you ever hear this Federal Trade Commission, that's not the purpose of this. This is to educate professional e-commerce brand owners as to how to comply with your rules and stay and stay compliant so let's talk about that for a minute i, I, I might bash the ftc then matt I'm yeah sorry. you can you can because you got a gigantic 50 state law firm that can protect you most of us are just kind of yep, yep, <laughs> we're, yep. out, we're out there on, on an island on our well, own and, and what, yeah what we're going to focus on is how to comply with the law of course too yes so let's let's talk about this for a minute uh, if you if everyone will remember back in 2018 uh, mastercard came out with their consent rules right and what does that mean when you're doing a, well, in that case, it was it was a trial. It was a negative option trial, but with a consent prior to the initial billing. And then a year and a half later, Visa came out with their rules that were similar, but they said, yeah, we don't care if it's a trial, if it's a subscription, you have to notify the customer prior to every billing, uh, basically a pre-billing notification autoresponder, three days, uh, no less than three days prior to the billing. So most of our clients were, were doing between three and five days prior to the billing. But uh, incidentally, we came out and published a document that Damon helped us write earlier this year, where above your submit button on your checkout page, we're telling you that you should have the terms by clicking below, you're agreeing to the terms of service and the privacy policy policy associated with this website. And that and obviously those are both linked to the terms of service and the terms of service can have the subscription, the subscription billing um, parameters built into it. Uh, also your privacy policies about data sharing and things of that nature. But if it's above the button and they click, they're consenting to your terms of service and privacy policy. That's not the end all be all to protect you, but it's one great way to do so so let's talk about and that, click to cancel yeah let me, let me just add to that so that's that's not required by law but it's a, a very important easy thing to do to help minimize the likelihood of a class action lawsuit because inside those terms the, the, the well-written terms are going to have a class action waiver provision and a mandatory arbitration provision so that's why you want to have that language it's kind of like there's no law that requires that you have a lock on your the front door of your house but most smart people have a lock on the front door of their house you want to okay. have um and if you have a castle you want to have a moat right if, but you you want to have that basically signature on the contract from the consumer where they're agreeing your liability is limited they can't bring a class action they can only bring a single person arbitration and other kinds of language that won't help you with the ftc but it's going to help fend off the sometimes equally, if not more zealous, class action lawyers, which can can be a really expensive kind of case to defend and deal with. So, but. And for those of you that weren't here earlier, it is Halloween. So happy Halloween, everyone. Um, I am today the problem solver. So <laughs> we are solving a problem today. I thought this was apropos for Damon's conversation. Um, I do have, and we, we did attach the link to the click to cancel rules. Um, you know, Carl from SolvePath has been a, a big proponent of this, talking about it. Carl owns a, a SolvePath, which is a customer service, self-service portal. It's very automated, very dynamic, allows customers to do just that. If they, if they want to call in and cancel or, or link from your website to cancel, you could do that. But I think the big part of this is protecting the consumer from being dragged into a subscription that they may or may not have wanted. You know, they're always going to say they didn't want it, whether they did or they didn't, whether it be digital product or physical product, and making sure that you have clear and concise subscription billing language in your terms of service, having your terms of service um, present, number one, on your page, uh, having it above the button for where they're 
clicking and consenting to your terms of service, but also making it easier for your customers to cancel. The, we've all seen scripts. Anyone who's been in subscription billing going into their call center with the save a sale, as Damon was referring to earlier, with some very aggressive tactics to try to get, oh, well, you know, we'll give you a 20% discount. We'll give you a 30%, a 50% discount, a 70% discount. Just give them their money back. If they want to cancel or they're not happy, just give them their money. Or they just want to cancel the subscription. Make it very easy for them to do so. What else, Damon, do we think the FTC would look at as a misrepresentation of the material facts of a good or service? Yeah, that, yeah, that's what I was getting at before. So basically what we have is, is Rosca with, with two things added. One is that they've turned it with the new rule. They've made it a false advertising law. It's not really about subscription billing. It, it repeats the elements of Rosca, but then it adds this other thing about how any material representation, so it could be the testimonial, it could be something in your, on your lander, or it could be a VSL or whatever. That This is a way for them to get money if it's a product or service sold on subscription. So that's the one thing that this is adding. And the other thing is the really focusing on what it means to provide a simple mechanism to cancel. And so, you know, I get, let me share my screen real quick, Matt. Please. Uh, all right. Okay. Yeah, so misrepresentations in connection with promoting or offering for sale any good or service with a negative option feature, that basically means selling anything on subscription. It's a violation to mis misrepresent expressly or by implication, and, and the words implication are vague, but uh, any material fact, including any of the following. So this is a is basically to misrepresent the subscription billing terms, the deadline to stop a charge. That's that's clear. The cost of the product or service. Okay, that makes sense. The purpose of the underlying good or service. So maybe you have a a supplement that uh, helps with blood sugar. If you start talking about diabetes and treating your diabetes, this could be viewed as a violation of the click to cancel rule. You might disclose all the billing terms just exactly right, but you said something about the purpose of the good or service that crossed the line. Health or safety, similar issue. Any other material fact. So this is really what a lot of the, the if I scroll up this, you see this document's 230 pages long, um, and I'm on page 225. The first 220 pages are the FTC discussing all of the comments it got in response to the proposed rule. Um, I'm active in an organization called the Performance Driven Marketing Institute. We submitted comments to this, but there was a lot of criticism about the rule, this part of the rule, because it's kind of punishing businesses that are selling on subscription. And a lot of consumers like products sold on subscription because there's convenience and there's lower cost, but this, this makes it risky. Um, so. I'm not, this is, I'm not trying to shout up here, but anybody selling on subscription would be smart to have a good lawyer go through their, uh, all their advertising to make sure they're not going to get caught under this part of the rule. Right. Um, and I think, I think yeah. E is the scariest one. Yeah. Any other material fact. I right. mean, it's so broad. Right. Right. And I think it's, they put it in that language because of the gotchas. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it's also misrepresented by implication. Yeah. Sort of like, let's read between the lines and what's implied by this. But that can be very subjective. It's not black and white. And the FTC sometimes says consumers, well, let me give you an example. The words up to. The FTC filed a case and settled it with Lyft. It was announced Friday. It had to do with Lyft advertising that drivers in New York City could make up to $38 an hour. Drivers in Salt Lake City could make up to $26 per hour. The FTC said, that's all deceptive because the data that they, is being used by Lyft to support those dollars per hour, that's the 80th percentile of drivers that make that much. That's not the mean average. It's not the average. Well, uh, but they said up to, and the FTC thinks that people don't know what the words up to mean. 
they think up to means average. Up to doesn't mean average. In, it's funny because the FTC is kind of hypocritical. They always brag about how they can get up to $51,000 per violation. But they don't average that. That's not what they get. So come on. I, I loving, one day I'm going to be in a room taking a deposition of an FTC official. And um, now they know how I'm going to set them up on that. But, but the, my point is, if you look at something from a jaundice perspective, you're going to find a, a misrepresentation by implication of material fact. You're going to, if you're predisposed to, to find it, you're going to find it. Um, so it's not clear cut black, white. So that's part of the rule. Um, just, you know, the rule is somewhat vague, but the rest of this rule really tracks Roska. Um, but then it requires that the means and medium to cancel be the same as the means and medium to purchase. So this is all about consent. It's again, very similar to Roscoe, but here we have the simple cancellation and simple mechanism, at least as simple as consent, the simple mechanism required by paragraph A must be at least as easy to use as the mechanism the consumer used to consent to the negative option feature. So if the folks on this call have a dashboard or a platform where consumers can log in. Um, we want to have a button that says cancel. Now, the proposed rule had language prohibiting any save the sale efforts. In the final rule, they took that out. And there, uh, there can be a very minimal effort to save the sale by saying, would you like to learn more uh, and consider any other offer at a better price? Or, uh, if no, you press skip and we'll cancel. Uh, but it can't, um, it can't be a gauntlet. And this is important as well. In no event shall a consumer be required to interact with a live or virtual representative such as a chat bot to cancel if the consumer did not do so to consent to the negative option feature. So um, the, the, they're, they're on the to chat bots and they want to make sure that there's not back and forth required. You could have this option as a way to cancel, but it can't be required. You need to have the other option that simple that people can simply click a button and cancel. And then this also Roska uh, only applies to online sales. So in, the rule expands beyond Roska to also include telephone sales and uh, products that are sold in person. So. That's um, that's basically the, the sum and substance of it. There are in the last few days there have been several cases filed around the country uh, by business organizations, business groups, chambers of commerce, uh, challenging the rule and the process. It was a the commission is split three to two: three Democratic appointees, two Republican appointees. Both of the Republican appointees have dissented. And uh, one wrote a very well done dissent about how the FTC is uh, kind of doing a power grab here. I know you don't, we're not trying to bash the FTC, but the, the dissent that's from a commissioner and, and she was a very thoughtful uh, dissent, but uh, says that the, you know, this is if Congress wanted to amend Roscoe, they could have done it. And for the FTC to come along and disadvantage subscription businesses this way, uh, it, it, there could have been a more narrowly tailored rule. And, uh, it, and really, really, it goes back to what I said before about the misrepresentation of material fact part of it. Uh, that's what's, I think, most troubling. To that, in, in my opinion, is the serious part because the in how vague that they've written their language, it's almost as if, Damon, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if they want to get you, they're going to find a way to get you. So I think the answer is to prepare yourself and the products that you sell. Make sure that you are complying with the rules. Don't do anything funny. Don't do, have any hidden subscriptions. Don't have anything that just, if someone saw it, they would, <laughs> they would see immediately that it's, it's scammy. 
um, but but also comply with the rules. If if we have the tools available to you, then use them. Um, it, it's so easy to to set up. I'm gonna um, Patrick asked a question about click to cancel buttons in your funnels, uh, receipt email, and separate emails. Uh, what exactly should should we do to comply? I'm gonna run you through some of that stuff. But before I start going through where some of the setup is within our system, any other questions that you guys have for Damon that we can ask now, uh, drop them into the QA and I will, uh, I'll start preparing my screen share for you. All right, let me know when you can see my screen. Yep. I pulled this up here. Guys, I dropped this into the invitation. I can send this to you again. It, it goes through basically just an overview. Yeah. But uh, obviously you can always go into the 231 page document that, that Damon was referencing. When exactly, Damon, does the new policy go into effect? Uh, 180 days from October 16. Unless, okay. unless uh, I, I think part of it actually goes in effect 60 days from October 16, uh, the misrepresentation part of it actually. Um, but we're gonna keep a close eye on on the cases that have been filed. And obviously you'll be one of the first to know if we see that a court's declared it to be unlawful. Great. Yeah. So for Checkout Champ users, I'm gonna run through this. If you guys are uh, selling headless on our platform through the other platform or through Checkout Champ, you can also create your membership sites leveraging the API. And again, if, if that's full headless commerce, you can create a member login uh, onto your site where they could go in, they can update, they can cancel their their membership. We call them clubs, you know, their subscriptions or their memberships. But with the checkout champ, it's really as, as easy as this. I'm going to go in, I'm going to choose other, and we're going to do, uh, I'm just going to start creating a, a I'm just going to call it member portal. Uh, I'm going to create a new campaign. I'm just going to skip through all this stuff so you guys can see how, uh, how simple is so I was I'm going to call it whatever it is memberportal.checkoutchamp.com or whatever your product is my skincare beautification.com so I, let me I'm just going to go ahead and skip through this and so I don't bore you to tears but once I have a blank canvas all right and so your domain URL is going to be here this if you have a blank canvas you'll have at the bottom right hand corner choose a template Sorry, it's loading the templates. It'll take a second. So I'm going to go into membership. You can see we have a whole handful of, of different membership funnels that you can use. I'm just going to click on this one, which is the responsive. And I'm going to choose that as the template. And it's going to populate onto the, the actual builder screen. And once it does, for those of you that are users of the platform, you'll be able to go into each one of these, the thank you page, and you'll be able to go in and customize background images, login pages. Login super easy. The login should be email address and order ID, unless you have some type of unique uh, password that the customer's setting up. And then in the member area, they're able to see all the items that they purchased. They can uh, look at their subscriptions. You could see cancel, restart, pause, edit. Excellent. Right. So this is this is what they want. A very simple, easy way to click a cancellation. Yep. And again, these are all customizable. You know, if I went in here, I can drag and drop these fields, change background images, front images, and whatever that might be. And now your question is going to be, well, how do I get them here? Within the CRM, in your campaigns, you'll be able to go into your autoresponders. And if you guys want to see that, I'll just show it to you real quick. So I'll, I'll just pick any one of these with recurring. So I'm going to go into my email autoresponders. We have autoresponders for pre-billing notifications. So event types, pre-billing. I kind of started playing around with one here. In your pre-billing notifications, I'm going to go into the advanced because it's prettier. We're actually going to get rid of the classic designs, but this is a, another drag and drop builder where I can make some of these changes. So here on the page, I'm going to go into where do I want to do this? Let's go to the let's go to the outside image. And I'm going to drop a button. 
And I'm going to go down and because I like the color orange, as all of you know, and I'm going to make that an orange button. And I'm just going to call it click to cancel. Wish I could type. Damon's got me all nervous. And then the button itself, I'm just going to link it to the new membership site that I created in Checkout Champ. And when the customer comes to that URL, it's going to take them to the login page and it's going to say email address and order ID. Now, we also have it set up where my team can give you the code that will just take the customer directly to the member portal that you embed on this page with a unique URL for that customer. It's pretty simple. We also have other tools in our platform like SolvePath, which is a fantastic uh, customer service platform. Like I said, self-service has a lot of um, AI built into it. Carl did a great job building this. He also has the ability to do click to cancel through his platform. While I'm in here, any questions, by the way, uh, when to notify, you could set this up, like I said, three to five days prior to. And then once you have that set up, you click update. You don't have to put in a billing cycle, right? So it'll send it out prior to the billing, three days in advance with this email that you can customize specifically for your brand. We're also capturing this. So if the autoresponder sends out, in this case, three days prior to the billing, we're storing that at the customer record that the email was sent. So if you ever get nailed, you could say, look, I have this entire list of, of emails that were sent to my customers three days prior to the billing. I've given them op the option. This is excellent. I mean, it's, it's, it's spot on. So we have a lot of these tools already built for you guys. I just, and we've had them for a long time. I just wish you'd start using them. Um, and hopefully you will now that there are uh, what could be severe penalties if you don't. So, and if you need anything additional, you know, my team is here to, to help you not only set it up, configure it, design it, but also if there's any other features or functions that you need, you know, we're willing to build it to make your lives easier and business flow smoother. So, Damon, what else um, do you think would be important to mention about click to cancel, FTC rulings, avoiding class action lawsuits? I mean, things that, and guys, it's not just you. If you get nailed with a class action lawsuit, all of your service providers get dragged into it also. So you're not just protecting yourselves and your company and the you know, the, the empire that you're building, you're protecting us. Yep. You're protecting your CRM, your fulfillment company, your call center, and everyone else in your sphere of influence. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, going back to 20 minutes ago, to putting aside click to cancel, having the consumer have to agree to the website terms of sale or terms of service on the checkout page and having the a paragraph that deals with class action waiver and mandatory arbitration is so basic and it's uh, it can save you millions and millions of dollars and that's that's why in our e-commerce legal guide that's the first section we've got like 25 sections each are like two three pages long it's really practical it's conversational it's written for business owners but that's the first topic we cover there because it's such a simple thing to do and um it blows my mind that there are e-commerce retailers out there that don't have this uh, I, I, let me tell you a quick story. I, I was at a client's wedding this summer and, um, he's a billionaire, beautiful, beautiful wedding. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And, uh, I was talking with a client, a good friend, and he was saying to me, Hey, Damon, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm a, it's, it might hurt conversion to have that language above the buy button. And I don't, you know, if it, if it hurts conversion by, you know, a tenth of a percent, then that's a lot of money. And I, and I said, hey, man, I don't think it's going to hurt conversion at all. It's absolutely common. People are used to this. They fill in their name, their address, their credit card number. It's not going to affect conversion. I've talked to many, many clients. I've got several hundred clients, hundreds of clients. They, it, it's not going to hurt it. I don't even want you to split test to just do it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I stopped and I said, hey, you know what? This is a, an amazing wedding, isn't it? I mean, it's a multi-million dollar wedding. He's like, yeah. I'm like, all right. 
Our friend would not be having this wedding right now if he hadn't followed my advice 10 years ago. And he's like, oh, okay, now I get it. I'm like, yeah. He's like, all right, let me call it back to the office right now. So our goal is to help clients make a lot of money, but also make sure they keep their money and they can sleep well at night. Um, and, and so what you've got, Matt, is to that end as well. And I, I think people should definitely uh, take full advantage. And I know I'm kind of going off on tangents here, but I, I think about the, the best professional athletes, you know, Lionel Messi, Michael Jordan, you name it, right? They are all uh, naturally athletically gifted and they all, um, you know, have just fierce determination. And in the same way, Checkout Champs clients are brilliant, creative, know how to split test, media buy, think creatively. But here's the thing that, you know, Tom Brady, Messi, whoever, I could, if I could think of some amazing female athletes, I would do so off the top. Uh, Caitlin Clark, how about that? They all, they all also understand the rules of the game. That's part of being a Hall of Fame athlete. Messi would be off sides. Michael Jordan would travel. You, know, you, you get red cards. If you don't understand the rules of the game, you're, you're selling yourself short. You're not going to reach your full potential. So it's important to understand the rules of the game so you stay in the game. And, uh, and, and so that's, yeah, again, a metaphor, but I think it's really important. And this will, you know, the FTC is on the warpath. They're really, really aggressive. Um, it might change if there's an, a new administration, um, but it won't change overnight. Um, and the, the Trump administration was actually pretty aggressive too, um, four years ago. I, I got a couple of questions for you. Yeah. You ready? I'm going to fire away. So Patrick asked, so we have up to 180 days. To get this done? <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, but there's some of the, some of the things, Patrick, I know you're being coy, but get the, uh, some of these things have to be in place within the next 60 days. So just, I would review, talk to your attorney, get it done. Yeah, and the California and then, law is already in effect, by the way. Yeah, so, already in effect. State yeah. by state, there's a few of them that, yeah. that are getting sticky about this. Um, are pre-billing emails required for all billing cycles? Do we send it each time, or does billing frequency make the difference? I think per the rule, you have to send it prior to each and every billing. Yeah, yeah, you do. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it could hurt retention, but if you have a great product and communication, I, I think retention is going to land where it's supposed to land. Another question was, how do we document that the person actually clicked the button? Yeah, actually, I had someone ask me that last night. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on this. What I mean, we have situations where, going back to the, the having to agree to the terms of sale yeah. and checking that box. And uh, there've been times when clients have been sued in court and we've said, this case can't be in court. The consumer agreed to the terms and therefore they agreed to the arbitration. And what we do is we have a declaration from the company's chief technology officer. And it says, you know, on this date, the consumer uh, who gave this name and this email address using this IP address at this exact time visited the site as a condition of purchase, they had to check this box and they then completed the transaction and they used, you know, this partial, you know, we'll give like four digits of a credit card number. And that's the declaration yeah. that we file with the court. And the court says, yep, looks like they agreed to the arbitration and the case is kicked out of court. Um, but I'm glad this question came up because the FTC rule requires, I think it's three years that you store the confirmation that the consumer agreed to the subscription billing terms. Did you say for three years? I think, that's, I think it's for three years. I could look at the rule right now, but yeah. So, all right. So, is that something that the answer? CRM would already just automatically capture? Ch Checkout Champ is storing the click. So, the IP address, the click when it happened, uh, when they consent to the purchase button, also to when they click through to the cancel. Um, you know, so if they're in the membership site and they've logged in, we're, we're capturing that login. Um, another question is, 
And do we need to make sure they cannot buy until the button is clicked? Yes. So, yeah. They cannot buy until the button is clicked. Are you talking, uh, Paul, are you talking about the initial sale or if they go into the member site and there might be other products to be purchased? Yes, on the initial sale. Yeah, so they cannot buy. Yeah, they, and they shouldn't be able to, Paul. I think if you put the, the by clicking below, you're agreeing to the terms of service and, and privacy policy. They don't necessarily need to check a box. Uh, as long as that's above the button, we're storing the click. All right. Correct. Does the but, FTC but I, only I wanna, go? I want to make sure go we ahead. keep two things. I want to. We got to keep two things separate. We need to make sure that the consumer is checking a box, or it's so obvious that they're confirmed will be agreeing to the subscription billing terms. That's sure. that's different than agreeing to the website terms of sale. If that makes sense. Two separate things there. Okay. One is, one is required by law. The other is like the, the front your front door having a lock on it. And, yeah. and, and just I put up on the screen here. Yeah, it's uh, keep or maintain verification of the consumer's consent for at least three years. However, if the seller can demonstrate by a preponderance of the evidence that he uses processes, ensuring no consumer can technolo technologically complete the transaction without consent, such seller does not have to main these records for such transactions. Yeah. So if you can't, the transaction cannot be completed unless the consumer checks the box agreeing to the subscription billing terms, then, then you're good. Okay. So another one, does the FTC only go, go after the big guys or will they go after the little, little guys too? They definitely go after the little guys. Um, I'm sorry to tell you that. I don't know if you're a little guy or a big guy, but uh, now the FTC, the biggest driver of enforcement is complaints and they have a non-public database called sentinel where they and it's not public it only can be accessed by law enforcement but they store all the complaints that have come in and it's uh an amalgamation of complaints that have been sent directly to the ftc complaints sent to the better business bureau complaints on trust pilot complaints received by state attorneys general offices um, i think they even have complaints that, from consumer gripe sites like ripoff report now they, they don't know necessarily whether a number is large or small in relation to the overall number of customers, they try to make an informed guess about that. You know, is 20 complaints high? Maybe if they only had a thousand customers. Is 200 high? Maybe not if they've had 20 million customers, but that's the biggest driver. But for litigation strategy reasons, and I'm gonna be bashing the FTC now, they will often go after the smaller companies that don't have the means to defend themselves because they are trying to get easy wins to build up a body of law and kind of then go up the food chain. It's the same kind of thing that patent trolls do. Uh, they call them non-practicing entities. You've got a patent, maybe you don't use it, but you go and you try to sue the smaller companies so they roll over and you get a lot of easy wins and then you, you take those and use them as you end up challenging bigger companies with deeper pockets. Uh, there's a company right now called Empire E-Commerce uh, another company called Econ Genius, Ecom Genius, that have been sued by the FTC in the last few weeks, month or so. And they're small companies, um, but the the crux of the complaint is that they violated the business opportunity rule because they say uh, in their advertising, we are a done for you service, business in a box. We will help build your e-commerce store and uh, grow your business and we'll be right there helping you run it and so on and so forth. But they're, what the FTC is trying to do there is they're trying to get a body of law that says the business opportunity rule, rule applies to business coaching and, and then go after bigger companies and claim the business opportunity rule applies to their business. Because what, said, what that's doing is establishing precedents. Exactly. So yes, they will go after smaller companies. Well, and, and going, back to your, going yeah. back to your Michael Jordan, example and Lionel Messi and you know they are very talented but they're also very successful and the more successful you become the bigger a target you become 100 percent. so if you plan to scale you don't want to be a small guy forever maybe you do um you know you're just going to become a target so start doing things the right way uh Paul asked do we have an example of the language the checkbox should have 
ideally real life example so we can see how a thriving business is doing it best. We yeah. do have some examples that we can provide to you, Paul. Yeah. I mean, you could go to, I was on a Zoom with a client just yesterday afternoon, and um, we were looking at, we've got you know, hundreds of clients doing it the right way, but I don't like to use other clients as an example sometimes because that can lead to questions about the other clients. But uh, we pulled up Netflix's site. And you know, I, I think Netflix is doing it the right way. It's um, it's really just a language saying, I understand I'll be charged X today and X every 30 days thereafter unless and until I cancel. Now, if you're selling a physical product, things can get a little bit tricky because you may need someone to cancel a couple days before the next charge because the product's getting ready to leave the fulfillment house uh, and is in route and then the language can, can be a little tricky there's a company the uh it's a, it's maybe nutriclick um that uh, a few years ago got in trouble for, for having some it, it, language that uh was a little confusing on that front yeah well and that's the other thing when you're doing your term your terms of service don't just copy it off of some other Schmo's website, have an attorney look at it, make sure it represents your product and really what your, uh, what your brand represents, I think, and make sure that it's, that it's clear and concise, especially with the subscription billings. Uh, Carl from Salt Path made uh, some interesting points. He said, if it does interfere with your retention, uh, there are post-sale strategies. You can do win-back programs to re-engage previous customers or reactivate canceled subscriptions. This doesn't prevent someone from coming back and reactivating a subscription or purchasing again. That's going to follow whatever business rules you put into place. Um, and if it does affect retention rates, the good news is data shows that having easy access subscription management will reduce customer frustration and disputes and increase save rates um, on your downsell attempts. So, you know, there is an opportunity as someone's exiting, like, you know, and that's the thing with subscriptions. If you're selling a product that's being delivered every 30 days, well, what we discovered a long time ago was in some cases, maybe it's too much product, right? Maybe you give them other options, they, you know, would every 45 days or 60 days be better for you, you know, but yeah. give them the opportunity to cancel if they need to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. a, that's a good one. There could be some businesses that are selling on subscription right now that decide to instead sell a product on a not open-ended, but uh, one year, this is what you're paying each month for one year and then hard stop, it ends. Yeah. And, and Another question came in, can you change the language after you're being litigated by the FTC? You cannot, you will have, uh, you, you're going to have a preservation. So what's that called, Dave, Damon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess to... You're going to have a preservation order. You can't change anything. Well, no, you can. I mean, you, you can. can. You can change it to comply with the law. And and that's fine. And that should be what the FTC wants. You can't destroy evidence. You need to keep a copy of what you had before. But you can change it to comply with the law. But the reality is... If the FTC is now brought an enforcement action against you, yeah. they likely will have a temporary restraining order and have a receiver appointed to run your company and they'll freeze your assets and your company's assets. So you yeah. don't have a business in existence anymore. And, and that's what's it's maddening. It, it's a due process violation. But these are cases where the case is often pretty much over sometimes before you even knew you'd been sued. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, so, the, so there's a further continuation of this. So on the checkout page, if there is no checkbox, but after litigated, I add it and say, but there was one, there's a service called the way, way back machine. They can look at oh, every yeah. single iteration of your website, going back to the, the moment you initially oh, yeah. published. Yeah. And, and so yeah, no, the, don't play sure. games with it. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And, and they will have already done that. I mean, the FTC in these cases will find ads that you haven't used, your Facebook ads library, 
or wherever. And uh, it may be that you didn't even know you had it up anymore, but they'll find it on the internet and then they will allege in the complaint that these are the ads you're currently using to sell your product, even though it may be 2021, 2022. Let me, let me send out this public service announcement. If there is any advertising out there that was aggressive, crossed a line, um, take it down right now. You don't need it up there. It's not good for your brand. It exposes you to risk. There's no need for it. If you're not using it to drive traffic, especially, there's no value in it. Take, take it down. And that, that includes Instagram posts and YouTube videos and Facebook posts. Take, take it down. You don't, there's nothing wrong with you doing that. Now, if there's a subpoena or a lawsuit, different situation. You have to preserve everything. But right now, for anybody out there, take it down. It's, it's, only, it's, it's a skeleton you don't need to have in your closet. That's a good point. Guys, you, you, you are moving fast and furious with new websites and new designs and new sales pages. Every single day, you're coming up with something new or some variation of it. Go back into your history and just get rid of all the old shit. You don't need it. If you want to save it on, you know, a three and a half inch floppy disk and I, put no it. Need, no, no, I wouldn't even do that. I mean, don't even do that. Just no. get rid of it. No, it's, 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 if, there's a, if there's an investigation, it's going to require production of all advertisements you've ever used. Mm -hmm. And it's fine to say we destroyed this because we wanted to make sure we never used it again. Yeah. You want someone to stumble on it and say, hey, this looks cool. No, we wanted to get rid of it permanently because we we're evolving. That's right. Yep. And there's an argument to, argument to be made that you're making an effort to do better. Well, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. Uh, yeah. That's right. All right. Does the FTC go for a lot of e-com guys? Yes, they do. Yes. You are the low hanging fruit. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Joel, you're hilarious. And yes, you should drink heavily if your hangovers aren't as bad as mine. Uh, Patrick, <laughs> you should, you should start, you should start a landscaping business. You'd be great at it. Trey, uh, what were you saying about a hard stop after a year, specifically referring to telehealth that provides medications where a prescription is only good for a year? Yeah. I'm saying something. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Um, so negative option means it, it continues, continues, continues into perpetuity until someone cancels. Um, but you could have a, uh, effectively, it's like a straight sale where you say you're paying this much for the product over the next year, and we're going to bill you each month. And at the end of the year, the transaction's completed. Like an installment pay over time, but it stops. Sure. So it's closed ended. It's not open ended. There could be some businesses that move to that model. That brings up a good point. Are, do installment payments? Like if I'm paying hundred dollars a month on a thousand dollar product that I agreed to purchase, does that fall under the same rule? No. Interesting. I'm not thinking about workarounds, guys. That's just a. Mm hmm. That's an interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yep. I mean, you still, Anything need, else, you, still, you still need to make sure you properly disclose the billing terms and you still need to make sure that you don't make material misrepresentations in your advertising. Uh, those are all smart things, but it, it wouldn't be considered a subscription billing or negative option model. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, there's, we can keep talking about click and cancel. There's something, another issue of law that I want to make sure we cover before you end. So just tell me when you want me to hit that jump right in okay so we're seeing a, just an onslaught of demand letters and uh, arbitrations and lawsuits concerning a california statute called the california invasion of privacy act or sipa and it started um, about a year and a half ago there was a, a decision out of the ninth circuit that uh, made it harder for a lot of plaintiff's lawyers to sue websites for website accessibility. And the Ninth Circuit includes California. And so the plaintiff's lawyers who were bringing these cases suddenly lost their gravy train and they said, oh, shoot, what are we going to do? Kind of like the FTC. They said, we better go back and hit the books. And they came up with a new kind of claim dealing with, you know, another angle. And that's 
that's what these SIPA cases are. California Invasion of Privacy Act is basically a wiretapping statute enacted in the late 1960s, making it illegal to wiretap someone and giving the person who's been wiretapped a right to sue. And someone in, in the California legislature maybe watched a James Bond movie and saw that they could have you know, hidden recording devices and martini olives or something. But they, the statute was enacted and the claims that are being brought are that when someone visits a website and they're cookied and there's information that's transmitted to Meta or TikTok, that that is effectively a wiretap recording them and sharing their information with a third party without their consent. We've even seen it in cases involving uh, chat boxes where you get on a website and it says, how can I help you today? And the plaintiff saying, well, the, the chat box company is a third party and they store that communication and therefore you're sharing someone's communication with a third party without their consent. Now, Interesting. that's how the internet works. Websites are talking to each other right in nanoseconds. That's how it works. Um, and at the same time, when you start talking about the internet and technology, there are judges who get confused and and um, arbitrators who get confused and, and the law is a little vague. And so uh, there are a couple of law firms in California that are that are just they've sent out tens of thousands of demand letters. One day I had three clients each send me the same demand letter they got. Um, just the names are different. And we have a section in our e-commerce legal guide talking about cookie monsters that's speaking to this. But the the best thing you can do to avoid these claims is to have a cookie banner on your site. And it's uh, hopefully we've won a couple of cases in arbitration for some pretty big brands. Hopefully a year from now, the courts will uh, properly interpret the statute. But um, in the meantime, the best thing you can do is put a cookie banner on your site so you can say that the consumer consented and that should dissuade the plaintiff's lawyers from sending you a demand letter. And they're typically demanding $20,000. Yeah, there's no way that someone who visited a website and had their information shared, arguably had their information shared, suffered $20,000 in damages. So right now, these lawyers are just it's, it's kind of shooting fish in a barrel. I have great news for everyone who is on Checkout Champ. We have a service on every single sales site that you create called Klein. It costs you like five bucks a month. Look at that. I got blood all over the place. It costs you five bucks a month. And it complies with all GDPR rules. Everyone thinks GDPR is, is for European Union stuff, but there are several states right now, I think seven or eight that are requiring the same type of uh, data protection laws. And not only does it protect against uh, website consent for cookies, but also for Americans with Disability Act. So your website, if it doesn't change colors for people that are, you know, maybe they're light sensitive or hearing sensitive, they need to hear things. It has those types of um, ADA compliance laws as a part of that. And it just, it embeds right on your website. You can change the colors, the styles, you can change everything you want to, but it's right in the settings of your, um, of your sales site setup, your sales funnel setup. You didn't know that, did you, Damon? I did not know it's that. It's good stuff. Yeah, that's great. All right. Okay. Um, can you ask him for an example of proper language for a one-year subscription that would be excluded from the new click to cancel law? Well, yeah, we, we need to make sure we don't call it a one-year subscription. Um, cause subscription connotes that it continues. Installment. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, Patrick, I think, um, if you want to follow up with me separately, um, I, nothing I, jumps to mind at the moment. Ah, oh, jeez! You guys are always looking for ways around it. Just follow the freaking rules, and you'll be okay. <laughs> always looking for workarounds. Um, you know, it's the industry is evolving, and the bigger it gets, the more people are going to want to regulate it. So it's just unfortunately the way all governments work. Any other questions? While I have Damon on, I don't see anything else popping up. So but what I'm going to say is, next week. Thursday, we are doing a, we're actually 
it kind of dovetails into this. We're going to be talking about the different types of subs subscriptions, the ones that are successful, uh, how to configure them within the system. And we're having a special guest called Pay. Yeah, Pay, everyone knows them as having 3D Secure. We are, to my knowledge, the first company that has the new 3D Secure 3RI, which actually securitizes and tokenizes every subscription billing. So that'll also protect your merchant accounts. It may be worth your time. We're going to send out some invitations probably tomorrow and, you know, come and learn about it. Anyway, Damon, any closing thoughts or words? Uh, nothing brilliant, insightful. Uh, just uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to talk. And uh, I'm impressed with the, all the features you've got. Guys, anytime we see something of value, we're gonna we're gonna do a webinar. I know the last we have like four weeks in a row. Some will probably take a couple of weeks off, but anytime we see something or find something that is um, important that we want to share with the with our clients, uh, you'll see these pop up. I would encourage you to join. I would encourage you to tell your buddies to join, even if they're not using the platform. Uh, if not, just to educate themselves of the ever-evolving e-commerce industry. So, Damon, thank you very much. Happy Halloween. Go get your costume on. All right. Appreciate it. Go knock on some doors and beg for candy. All right, everyone, have a great day. We'll see you next week. And this will be live on replay on YouTube in probably a few hours. Great. Thank you. Take care. Bye.